Good evening and welcome, a very warm welcome to the latest talk in our 220th session. My name's Campbell Forrest, I'm a member of the Council of the Society, and we've got a couple of housekeeping announcements, the usual ones. First of all, there is no fire drill planned for this evening, so if the alarm goes off, please make your way to the three exits. It won't be a, a pretend one. The second thing is, please uh, check your phones, make sure they are off for the duration of the talk. A couple of other quick points. Um, the society since moving to Glasgow is extremely keen to uh, welcome as many students to our talks as possible. The ones who come realize it's not such a, an august sounding society as it may seem. And I think there may be one or two here this evening. And I'd be really interested if you didn't mind waving a hand to show if there are one or two students here. Smashing, great, excellent. <laughs> that smashing let let all the other students in the university know will you if you enjoy yourselves the second very quick thing to say is that the council is extremely keen to receive any comments reviews on talks and these are started to be published in the uh, news section of the the website there's some there already, and I would encourage you to have a wee read at them. Um, so please feel free to do that. On to this evening. A couple of weeks ago, we had a terrific talk, by all accounts, which took us to the far limits of our universe via the James Webb Telescope, to outer space. This evening, is going to be different. We're going to travel in the other direction to the inner space of the limits, both physical and mental, of human beings. We're going to welcome Stephen Venables, a world-renowned mountaineer and explorer. He's an award-winning author. He's past president of the Alpine Club and the South Georgia Association. Stephen studied at New College Oxford in English literature and language and somehow managed to make the turn away from a beckoning career in theatre into mountaineering. The two don't seem to be that connected to me, but no doubt he can explain that better than me. He le this led to numerous expeditions and first ascents in the Himalaya in the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and also climbs in virtually every part of the world. He's led many parties to South Georgia, including several on the Shackleton Traverse across the peaks of South Georgia, the renowned Shackleton Traverse. And I did hear a rumor that he may well be planning another one sometime in the future. So if anybody feels themselves up to and physically capable, I'm sure he'd be delighted to. <laughs> add you to the waiting list. In writing, he has won numerous awards, including Best Book on Mountain Literature and also the Grand Prize at the Banff Mountain Book Festival. So for those of you who may want to find out a bit more about Stephen's exploits, there's a ready-made reading list. Just quick clicks of Google and it will take you there. And less any of you think that Stephen may be resting on his laurels, I can vouch personally that he still leads mountain rock climbs in the extremely severe grades and pioneers the odd first ascent around Scotland. A few years ago, Stephen and his wife Rosie, who's also here tonight, decided they would move to live in Scotland. And I've heard said that he wonders why it took him so long to do so. And this was despite the fact that he chose to live in Edinburgh rather than Glasgow. <laughs> this evening is going to talk about his great ascent of the unclimbed, then unclimbed east face of Mount Everest, the Kanshung face. And I'd now like to invite Stephen to give us this evening's talk. <laughs> 
Thank you, Cam. Uh, before I start, I want to make quite sure you can hear me at the back. Yes? If my, you can. Is that a yes? Yeah, good, right. Um, if I, my voice should drop, it's no good waving your hands because I won't notice. Just shout out, speak up. And shout it good and loud because I'm deaf. <laughs> Thank you, Cam, for that generous introduction. I should point out that one of my very, very few new routes in Scotland was actually climbed with Cam on the Isle of Lewis a couple of summers ago, and, and very enjoyable it was too. But like, tonight I'm going to talk about Tibet, and I'm going to talk principally about the very first expeditions that went to Mount Everest just over a century ago. So it's very much a, a step into the past, but, but a, a bit about the present as well. I first, um, and could we have some, do we get some lights out so the, the pictures look better? I don't know. It would be good if we could, thank you. Um, I first really became aware of Mount Everest when I was about 11, when I read this book by Sir Francis' young husband, a, a, a posited account of the early attempts on Mount Everest in the 1920s and the 1930s. So I sort of became aware of the world's highest mountain. Then when I was uh, 13, I was sent to a boarding school called Charterhouse in the south of England. And I mention this because it so happened um, that these, these public schools, um, as they were known, uh, which were hideous places, it had actually become quite civilised by the 1960s, but if you read accounts of these schools in the early years of the 10, 20th century, they sound really, really grim. And part of their remit was to produce uh, uh, servants of king and empire to, to, to serve the British Empire. Fine, upstanding characters like this chap, Edward Shabir, um, actually a botanist. In fact, one of the very few botanists, uh, non-Scottish botanists, to work in India. He works in the forestry service there. Actually, a very interesting chap. And it so happened that there were, were a number of other alumni uh, from the school uh, associated with, with Mount Everest, including Edward Norton and the great Scottish mountaineer Norman Colley, who was involved with the early expeditions, um, and also um, a man called Wilfred Noyce, who was on the first ascent of the mountain in, in 1953, and he had taught at the school. Another man who taught at the school uh, was on the very first Everest expedition of all in 1921, George Mallory and in fact gave up his post at the school in 1921 to join that very first expedition. I am an extremely unsporty person. I cannot hit a ball to save my life. But when I was at school, uh, as a way really of avoiding football, I occasionally would spend afternoons playing fives, which um, if you're not familiar, familiar with it, it's a bit like squash, except you, you hit the ball with your hand in this, this, this enclosed court. And I mentioned that because it occurred to me quite recently that when when Mallory was teaching the school back in the in the early 20th century he was a keen fives player and one thing that that amused me when they found Mallory's body high on Everest in 1999 in his pockets amongst various bits and pieces they found an unpaid bill from a, an outfitters in Godalming for a pair of fives gloves which I thought was a very sort of quintessentially British Anyway, don't worry, I'm not going to bore on about my school days all evening. I just mentioned that in passing, just to make the point that, that, that I was sort of subliminally aware of Everest and the Himalaya and mountaineering. Uh, not that it made me become a mountaineer, but it was just sort of there at the back of my mind as something interesting that perhaps one day I might follow up. Well, uh, fast forward 20 years, and I had become a climber myself. And in 1987, I was on an expedition to Mount Shishapangma, uh, one of the highest mountains in the world. And here at our, our Camp 2, we were greeted with the most glorious view. I'd been going to the Himalayas for about 10 years. I'd been on, yeah, I'd been there at least 10 times. But I'd never been to this part of Nepal and Tibet. And it was really exciting to look out eastward along the Nepal-Tibet frontier. And there, about 70 miles away out to the east, were four of the world's six highest mountains, including the highest of all. And, and seeing Everest for the first time, actually seeing it in the flesh, in the rock, it was very exciting to see the famous features like the, the Great Kulwar and the Yellow Band and the Northeast Ridge and the first step and the second step, all these things I, I'd read about over the years and become very familiar with. 
And what's extraordinary is that it all seems so familiar now, and we've read and heard so much about it. But 100 years ago, virtually nothing was known of the world's highest mountain. It had been sighted by Europeans. It had even been photographed, as in this uh, late 19th century photograph taken from somewhere near Darjeeling. And at the conclusion of the great trigonometrical survey of India, uh, the, the mountain had been identified and uh, the a Bengali mathematician called Radhanath Sikdar, after months of incredibly complicated sums, taking into account the refraction of, of, of the atmosphere, uh, computing different readings taken from very distant survey stations, some of them from hundreds of miles away, he worked out that this mountain was, was 29,029 feet above sea level, uh, which is actually an astonishingly accurate computation and therefore must be the highest summit on Earth. At that stage, as I'm sure you know, no Westerners were allowed into Nepal on the south side of the country, nor were they allowed into Tibet. However, as you also probably know, in 1904, uh, Britain staged a rather ill-advised uh, so-called diplomatic uh, mission uh, led by Colonel Husband uh, to, to Tibet. It was all prompted, the whole of British foreign policy was prompted by what turned out to be a misplaced fear of Russian involvement in Tibet. Nothing changes. And after the, the so-called diplomatic mis mission, which was basically an invasion, uh, unlike the Chinese, we had the good grace to leave, but we did believe one. We did leave behind one one trade agent. So there was a sort of link with Tibet. And in the early years of the 20th century, everyone was saying, mountaineers were saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go to Tibet and have a look at Mount Everest, maybe try and climb it? And many overtures were, were made, but nothing happened. Then the First World War intervened, but eventually in 1920, after a lot of pressure from people like Lord Curzon. Uh, a, a letter arrived, a passport arrived from the Dalai Lama uh, giving permission for a British expedition to go and have a look at Mount Everest from Tibet. And I'll just read out the, a brief translation of this. Um, I should have had this ready. Brief translation. The Dalai Lama uh, told the people of his country that all the people of the country, wherever the Saabs may happen to come, should render all necessary assistance to maintain friendly relations between the British and Tibetan governments, dispatched during the Iron Bird year with the seal of the Prime Minister. And so in 1921, a group of British explorers arrived uh, here in Darjeeling uh, at the northern frontier of India in Bengal, about to start the long 250 mile trek to Mount Everest. There with the uh, Lord Ronalds Hay, who was the governor of, 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 um, of Bengal, the, the, the chap in the glasses standing slightly at the front. To his left is the expedition leader, Colonel Howard Berry, who had actually done a recce the previous year, 1920, to sort of lay the groundwork for this expedition. On the far left um, is, is the great Scottish mountaineer, Harold Raybon, uh, undoubtedly the most experienced mountaineer in the team, an amazing record here and all over the world, including the Himalaya. And he was actually the, the climbing leader of the expedition, but unfortunately, he was actually considered rather old. He was only about 50, but anyway, he wasn't that old, but he did get very ill. He got so ill, in fact, that he was unable to take part in most of the expedition. And so what happened actually, most of the, the sort of mountaineering exploration in 1920-1 was done by young Guy Bullock and George Mallory standing there in the silly hat. And so they really became the, 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 the sort of main mountaineering impetus in this exploration. Well, here they are about four months later, uh, not looking quite so dapper. <laughs> Guy Bullock is standing at the back on, on the on the on your left. <laughs> it's, it's, it seems to have suffered serious hair loss. Notice, notice they all got their pipes out. You know, it's an essential piece of equipment for a proper explorer to have your pipe to hand at all times. And uh, Harold Rayburn actually sitting sitting down at the right in those wonderful uh, sheepskin leg warmers. He at this stage had actually finally got a bit better, and he trekked all the way from Darjeeling to rejoin the expedition right at the end of the expedition uh, when this 
photo was taken in about August or even September 1921. Uh, sitting on the other side of the front is Heron, the, the geologist. Next to him, looking slightly crazed, uh, a remarkable man called Wollaston, Sandy Wollaston, who was an extremely experienced explorer. He'd already explored Papua New Guinea with some of Shackleton's friends. Howard Berry, still actually looking wonderful, sort of debonair uh, at the front, some amazingly relaxed. At the back, as I mentioned, Guy Bullock, Guy Bullock, George Mallory. But sadly, missing from this photograph is a member who had died during the approach march before they even got to Everest, and that was the great Abedonian mountaineer, um, Alexander Kellis. I almost forgot his name there. Kellis was probably the most, he was, he was the most experienced high altitude mountaineer alive in 1921. A physician by trade, he worked as a, as a, as a chemist uh, based in, in Aberdeen, uh, but in, in his long summer holidays, he did amazing expeditions to the Himalaya. He'd made first ascents of, of, well, the highest mountains that had been climbed at that time in 1921. And he was a, a very interested in, in high altitude physiology and knew more about that subject probably than anyone else alive. But alas, he got run down from a previous expedition and he just died of a heart attack, aged only still in his 40s, I think, during the approach march. So great loss to the expedition. The real heroes of this expedition were the two surveyors. Uh, Henry Moore's head with his old fashioned plane table and the Canadian Oliver Wheeler with his newfangled uh, photo theodolite. And between them, they mapped a vast tract of, of country. This is just part of the map they produced. There was an existing map dating back to the young husband invasion, but it, it wasn't a very good map. And as Moore, Moore's head commented on the existing map, the rivers flowed in opposite direction to those shown on the map, and mountains were shown where there were none. Uh, it was pretty useless, this map. So they, they put this straight and, and it was just an astonishing achieve, achievement. Bearing in mind, this was done during the months of, of May, June, July and August, basically during the monsoon, when a lot of the time it's raining, it's snowing, it's overcast, it's cloudy, and you could go for days on end without seeing any of the summits. <laughs> well, the, the, the sort of micro exploration of the actual mountain, because the remit of the expedition was to explore the area, to explore the geology, uh, explore the natural history uh, and so on. But, but also the remit included to see if they could find a route, a possible route to climb the world's highest mountain. And that was really the job for, for Mallory and, and, and Bullock. And right from the beginning, even from a distance, they could make out uh, the North Ridge, which seemed to be the most likely way to the summit from Tibet. But in front of the North Ridge is a peak they call Changsi, which means North Peak. It's a peak of about 24,000 feet. And it took a long time to work out how to get to the coal, the, the, the pass, the, the saddle between Changsi and the North Ridge, which became known as the North Coal. And initially, Mallory and Bullock couldn't find a way to get to it. And after looking at the north side for some time, they then made their way round to the east to join Howard Berry and the rest of the team in a, in a village called Carter over on, on the east side, on the right-hand side of the map there. And they made their way around there. And in Carter, Howard Berry had set up a new, a new base camp. He'd, uh, he'd commandeered a house, which he'd used as a dark room for the printing of photographs. Howard Berry was a very keen photographer. This was his portrait of the Dzongpen, the head man of Carter with his wife, with his splendid hairdo. Wollaston was also a wonderful photographer, and this was his photograph of the Dzongpen of Carter with his wife and child, clearly not the same person. And he explained in his, his chapter in the, the book of the expedition that there was a tradition in this part of Tibet that in, in many of the villages and, and principalities and regions, the, they would have two Dzongpens rather than one. And the idea was they keep an eye on each other. And that was a way of stopping corruption, which actually seems a very sensible idea. Well, from Carter, they explored in various directions and several teams, both in 21 and the subsequent year in 2022, 1922, they went over into the lower Karma Valley, which is one of the most wonderful places on earth with these giant trees. It has some of the finest forests anywhere in the Himalaya. 
This picture was actually taken in 1922 of an unlikely um, Indian Army officer called John Morris, who hated being in the Indian Army, Indian Army uh, but loved getting away to work on this occasion as transport officer for the 1922 uh, Everest expedition. And he got over into the, um, into the Karma Valley, photographed next to a, a, the famous giant lily of the Himalaya, the Cardiocrinum giganteum, which you might not be able to see very clearly. So here's one uh, in a friend's garden in Morningside, photographed a couple of summers ago. <laughs> no need to go to Tibet. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful plants. And I mention this because, as I said, this was a geographical expedition. It wasn't just a climbing expedition. And Wollaston, Sandy Wollaston, was, was amassing a great collection uh, of, of animals and plants, many previously unknown to science, like Primula, uh, Primula beriana, which he named after the expedition leader. And for himself, he, he, he bagged this exquisite Primula Wollastoni. And he even found a shrew, previously unknown to science, right up by the Carter Glacier at about 20,000 feet above sea level, which he called famous Everestii. So there was all this kind of scientific work going on in, in conjunction with the, the climbing exploration. I, uh, in 1998, was lucky enough to go over into that lower Karma Valley. Uh, and this was in, I think we were there in September, it was sort of tail end of the monsoon, quite misty, but just the most beautiful, beautiful country. And we got a glimpse into those amazing forests. And I would love to have gone further down that valley, but our, we weren't allowed to. And we were going at this point to turn right back up towards Mount Everest. But we did have a wonderful day on this trek, a whole day of just sort of wading through fields of gentians and eventually getting to a point where you look into the upper Karma Valley towards Mount Everest and realize why in Tibetan Buddhist mythology, this, this valley, this, this region of Everest is called a Bayul, which is a, a, a sort of Buddhist notion of a, a center of sacred power, a sort of haven, a, a, a sacred reserve. And it is just the most beautiful place I've, I've ever been to. Well, that Karma Valley runs up towards the east face of Everest. And back in 1921, when Bullock and Mallory set off from the village of Carter over on the, the right-hand side of the map there, it seemed most improbable as they headed first southward and then eastward towards a pass called the Lang Malar. And they said, are we really going to, to Mount Everest? And the, the local Tibetans were quite vague about Chomolunga and which mountain was Chomolunga, uh, which is the local name for Everest. But they assured them they were going the right way. And sure enough, they got to the Lang Malar. And this is actually my friend, American friend, Ed Webster on the Lang Malar at about 18,000 feet above sea level. And this is in, in March, 1988, a glorious morning just after dawn uh, in late winter in this beautiful clarity of light, looking into the Karma Valley uh, with, with Everest about 18 miles away in the distance. And um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, the, the, the magnificent peak on the left is Makalu, which is the, the world's fifth highest mountain and, and, and um, with its subsidiary summits of Chomolonzo. Anyway, wonderful country. But it was very different in 1921 because they were here during the monsoon. Half the time it was clanged in, they, they could barely see anything. In this photo, I think taken by George Mallory, uh, looking up the Kangshun Glacier to the east face, most of the mountains invisible. And there's just a glimpse of the summit towering at the, at the top of this three and a half thousand meter high mountain wall. Now, if if Mallory and Bullock had managed to climb 1,000 meters or so up the east face of Everest and looked across, this is the view they would have had of these tremendous precipices just dropping down into the clouds, looking across to a much lower peak of about 6,500 meters called Katze. And in fact, later on, Mallory went to climb Katze with a young Sherpa called Nima, who was there helping the expedition. And they made the first, and I think possibly only ascent of that beautiful mountain, Kartse. And from Kartse, Mallory uh, took a picture looking up at the northeast ridge of Everest. The giant east face is on the left, and the northeast ridge is sort of running down towards the, the camera. And they looked at it and wondered about it, and then looked at some, some tremendous great pinnacles rising up halfway along the ridge, um, blocking the, the final ridge to the summit. I thought this, this just looks far, far too difficult. Uh, which was a correct assessment because um, it was only finally attempted 
1982, when a friend of mine called Dick Renshaw led, led a pitch up those, the start of those pinnacles, probably the hardest thing that had been done at that altitude at that time, suffered a mild stroke and had to go home. And a couple of days, well, a couple of weeks later, the expedition leader, Chris Bonington, waved goodbye as Peter Borman and Joe Tasker set off to see if they could find a way through those pinnacles. And uh, they, were, they were never seen again. Back in 1921, what they wanted to do was get to the North Ridge, which, which is slanting up from the right, uh, uh, almost out of the picture. And they were still trying to find this elusive North Col. Well, now they've got a camp up near Kartzil on the upper Carter Glacier. This is looking past Kartzil, Manor's Peak on the left there. Uh, Lotzi, the world's fourth highest mountain, is, is the dark uh, triangle um, just left of centre dropping down to what they call the South Col, the South Pass, and then the ridge rises up to the summit of Everest. And over on the far right, on, on, in slightly in shadow, is the profile of the North Ridge, which they were trying to get to. And finally, after climbing up to yet another high pass, they got this huge, great expedition with all their porters helping. They got them all up to a pass called the Lac Palar, looked down, looked across, and there, just across the glacier, was, was the sort of Holy Grail, of the North Col, they'd finally made it. Well, if only they'd had a satellite photo, they should have, could have saved themselves so much trouble. And now it's so easy, and the rather sad thing is that this kind of old fashioned foot slogging exploration has, has been made redundant. So you can just sort of look at it on Google Earth and see where to go. At least you can get a very good idea of the general picture of things but they'd done it the, the far more interesting way and they'd finally found the North Coal. Uh, it was shortly after that, that, that that the Canadian surveyor, Oliver Wheeler, rejoined the team and, and mentioned um, as tactfully as he could to, to George Mallory that he'd missed a very obvious turning into the East Strongbrook Glacier several weeks earlier. And they could have just come up from the north up the Strongbrook Glacier and got to the North Col, which is what all subsequent expeditions to this day have done when they've gone to the north face of Everest. But they would have missed that wonderful journey round to the east side and, and to the Kangshan Glacier. Well, they'd found a way to the North Col. It looked as though the North Ridge leading up onto the Northeast Ridge might be a climbable route to the summit. They had a brief go at it in 1921, but they'd been on the go for four months. They were run down, they were exhausted, uh, and it was out of the question. So they went home, and a few months later, the first of many expeditions arrived actually to see if it could climb Mount Everest from the north, from Tibet. And there was a pattern of these expeditions trekking all the way from Darjeeling. It was a journey that took about a, a month or so, and finally arriving at the monastery in Rongbuk. And I visited the Rongbuk monastery in, in 1998, and it was a very moving moment because I had with me a, a, a man called Edward, uh, not Edward, no, Bill Norton. And Bill here is presenting to the monastery a photograph taken actually in 1924, taken by Noel O'Dell, a, a geologist and climber who was on the 1924 expedition. And the photo shows Bill's father, Edward Norton on the right, George Mallory and Geoffrey Bruce holding his hat rather reverentially during the puja, the blessing ceremony by the, the abbot of the monastery at Rombok and they just arrived to attempt Mount Everest. Behind them are some of the Sherpas who've come with them from Darjeeling to help with all the ferrying of luggage up the mountain. Lovely photo and very moving to, to see a Bill presenting it to the monastery many years later in 1998. Geoffrey Bruce on the left, he was the nephew of the expedition leader, Charlie Bruce. And the amazing thing about Geoffrey Bruce is he was, a, he was an officer, in, a Gurkha officer in, in, the, in the army in, based in India, as, as was Edward Norton based in the Indian army. But Geoffrey Bruce was not a climber. He'd never climbed anything in his life. But in 1922, on the first expedition, he came on two years before this picture was taken. In 1922, with George Finch, who was undoubtedly the, the outstanding mountaineer in 1922, far more experienced than anyone else, very capable, but, but had been blackballed in 1921 and was blackballed again in 1924. George Finch took Geoffrey Bruce with him and together they established a world 
altitude record, getting to over 27,000 feet above sea level, way above 8,000 meters. And this is them returning from their very bold attempt uh, with um, Jeffrey Bruce in front and following behind, returning to the North Coal is George Finch. And George Finch was, was um, a scientist, by, a chemist, a chemist by trade. He ended up as, as um, a professor of chemistry at Imperial College in London. Uh, during the Second World War, he did a lot of very important work on with the fire service on ways of dealing with putting out fires from German bombs. Um, a very distinguished man and a very distinguished mountaineer. And being a man of science, he, he said that the, the way to get up this mountain was to use supplementary oxygen, these very primitive oxygen sets, which were then being developed by the RAF back at home. Uh, they look incredibly cumbersome, incredibly heavy, a nightmare to use, uh, full of, of problems that are, are going to cause you all manner, manner of trouble on the mountain. But he was convinced this was the way to climb the mountain. And he did demonstrate that if used successfully and competently, and if you get the damn thing to work, an oxygen set could enable a human being to, to move much more easily and much more quickly at extreme altitude. But many people were skeptical about it. And, and I don't think they could just face the, the pilar of, of using these very heavy sets and certainly Edward Norton and, and Howard Somerville, uh, who it, were on both the 1922 and 1924 expeditions, uh, were having none of this oxygen nonsense. And without all that contraption, in 1924, these two did an astonishing climb where they made a rising traverse across the upper part of the North Face. And then Somerville was not feeling very well, so he stopped and said, you carry on without me. And he took this famous photo in, in, on June the, June the 5th, uh, 1924, of Edward Norton continuing alone across these rather tricky, sort of slopey, slabby rocks uh, heading towards the summit. And Norton got to a point in what has become known as the Norton Couloir, Norton Gully, uh, just about... 800 feet short of the summit, well, well over 8,000 meters. The summit's at 8,850 meters. Uh, and that remains a record, a height record for climbing without supplementary oxygen until it was finally broken uh, by Reinhold Messner and Peter Haber in 1978. An astonishing achievement, uh, but they were sensible, these people. They, they weren't going to do anything reckless. And Norton felt by midday that he could continue, but if he did continue, he might not come back. And he also had a friend waiting for him several meters, behind, 100 meters behind now on the North Face. So rather reluctantly turned around, rejoined Somerville, and they made their way safely back to the North Coal, where George Mallory and Sandy Irvin, the youngest member of the team, were getting ready for their attempt and deciding that on the basis of what Finch had demonstrated two years earlier, they would take the wretched oxygen equipment. So they, they went with oxygen with the help of, of some of the Sherpas helping the expedition. They got to camp five and to camp six. And on June the 8th, they set off from camp six at some time in the morning. We're not quite sure when heading for the, the summit. This was a photo taken many years later in the 1970s of Noel O'Dell, who came up on June the 8th, 1924 to see them to see how they were doing and he hoped possibly to meet them returning from the summit and that morning of june the 8th he ran about mid-morning he got up to the area close to camp six and thought he saw a couple of figures silhouetted up on the northeast ridge before the clouds moved in and they disappeared and it always seemed to be slightly vague about exactly where he did see them, even whether he really did see them but whatever whatever the answer all we know is that they didn't return. They didn't return alive. And George Mallory's body was eventually found badly injured from a fall um, lower down the face from having fallen. Uh, and that was found in 1999. So nothing, we still have no idea whether they made it to the summit. The, the likelihood seems to me that they probably did not make it. Well, there's Noel O'Dell, the last person to see them in 1924. Lovely picture of, of what seems to be a very happy team uh, and a very harmonious team. And you might have read a book called um, 
The Great Silence is a wonderful book by Wade Davis. It's an account of these early expeditions, uh, drawing on the experience of all, nearly all these men had in the Great War, often horrific experience. They had seen and experienced terrible things. And Wade in his, is, to my mind, otherwise excellent book, seems to sort of draw the inference that, that because they'd experienced such terrible things and had seen death on a previously unimaginable scale that in some way they were, were inured to death they were prepared to throw away their lives in a great sort of final heroic sacrifice which i think is actually uh, completely wrong i think they the, the reverse is the true they they had been lucky enough to survive the great war and they were jolly well not going to throw away their lives needlessly and i think they were actually by modern standards rather cautious and conservative in their approach and Poor old Mallory and Irvin were just unlucky and, and bad luck happens in the mountains uh, and it's got nothing to do with, 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 with skill or experience or anything else. Things just go wrong. Well, this is the other team photo from, I think, 1922. And it shows what, what a big enterprise this was. There are a lot of local Tibetan people and a number of, of Nepalese Sherpas who've come all the way from Darjeeling, where they tended to base themselves in those days, looking for work with expeditions. And they, they're all working together, lugging this incredibly cumbersome, heavy, awkward equipment up and down the mountain. And that pattern remained more or less the same in 1953, when the mountain was finally climbed from Nepal by the British expedition. Uh, again, a, a large team of, of Nepalese Sherpas helping with all the ferrying of luggage up and down the mountain. Uh, very different from nowadays, where the whole show is run by the Sherpas. In those days, the show was very much run by the Saabs, the white men and the Europeans, uh, who were the experienced climbers, who, who I, I think I get the impression, uh, took great pains actually to, to ensure the safety of their workforce. And interestingly, on all those early expeditions before the war, uh, apart from Mallory and Irvin and seven Sherpas who were tragically killed in an avalanche in 1922, apart from them, there were no deaths and there were very few injuries. One or two people got frostbite, but I think generally these were quite cautious, conservative expeditions. And wonderfully in 1953, thank God no one died. And, and no one was injured, and they returned successful and safe. Well, I mentioned 1953 because I got to know, uh, many years later, the leader of that expedition, John Hunt. And it was really thanks to him that I was invited to go to the mountain on the official 35th anniversary expedition in 1988. And not only did I go, get to go and climb Mount Everest, I got a new watch as well. So I got to go to the mountain. It was all really thanks to John Hunt, who was the, the so-called honorary leader of the 35th anniversary expedition, which was essentially an American enterprise to go and attempt a new route up the great east face of Mount Everest. And just going back very briefly to 1921, just to remind you, George Mallory and Guy Bullock came up the Karma Valley to the Kangshun Glacier as did the expedition leader, Howard Berry and Wollaston and the others. And Mallory didn't have much success with his photography. He kept um, putting the, 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 the plate slides in back to front and, and coming home with blanks, but occasionally he got it right. And on this occasion, he produced the most beautiful photograph. It's taken looking sort of a slant across the great east face of Everest on the right and the northeast face of, of Lhotse on the yeah. left with a South Col in between. And I reckon he took this picture about 10 minutes after sunrise. First thing in the morning when you get this wonderful light on his face, a wonderful modeling of these terrifying great glacial terraces and, uh, and ice cliffs that are sort of sprawled and draped over the upper slopes of this three and a half thousand meter high precipice. And it is, it is the most, spectacular and, and frightening place and when they came this way up they obviously noticed that the dip of the south coal and thought well if you could get to the south coal uh, that might be a way to the summit but we we, we can't get to it from the other side because that's in nepal and, and that's forbidden in those days 
And as for this side of the mountain, well, it just looked, it looks completely balmy. And uh, Mallory put it rather more eloquently. He put other men less wise might attempt this way if they would, but emphatically, it was not for us. And they then proceeded to find their way around to the North Coal. Well, talk about throwing down the gauntlet. Uh, it was a long time before that gauntlet was, was picked up. But in the 1980s, well, around about 1980, the Chinese communist government started allowing foreigners to return to Tibet and people, Euro Europeans returned again to the north side of Everest. And then an American called Andy Harvard said, what about the east face? Let's go and have a look at the east face. And he did a recce. And then in 1983, a big American expedition of some very fine climbers doing some extremely hard technical climbing succeeded in climbing the great central buttress of the east face of Everest. And uh, six members, including my friend Carlos Bueller, uh, using oxygen made it to the summit of Everest and it was a fantastic achievement which has, has always been rather I feel overlooked in the in the Everest history books a, a tremendous climb so the great east face of Everest was finally climbed in in 1983 and then five years later 1988 we arrived just four of us to see if we could have a go at that face as well this picture was taken um, in, in Tibet in a place called Shega, and it was the first, actually, it was the first time the four of us all met together. Paul Tier uh, is a Canadian who grew up and spent all his life in California, where he works as a builder and carpenter. Ed Webster um, is from New England, uh, but spent many of his formative years in Colorado, where he was one of the great pioneer rock climbers of the 1970s and 1980s, and a very fine mountaineer too, and a wonderful photographer. Alas, no longer with us. He, he suddenly died of a heart attack last year, aged just 66. Uh, Robert Anderson, it was thanks to him we all went to Everest. He actually was the leader of the expedition. He put this thing together. He was sort of brazen enough to, to say, let's see if we can go and climb the Kangshun face of Everest. And brazen enough to persuade John Hunt to become uh, honorary leader of the expedition, and, and hoping he might end up with lots of British companies sponsoring the expedition. Alas, all he got was a British climber sort of dumped in his midst, parachuted in at the last minute. And it says a lot for the generosity of my American companions that they, they put up with me all that time, all the four months we were away, and, and actually have remained good friends ever since. Well, it was very thrilling to arrive in Shega where that photo was taken, and to think we were falling in the steps of those early expeditions from 60 years, over 60 years earlier, uh, and, and to, see, to see these places for ourselves. And then uh, to continue, not on horseback, but in, in, a, in a Chinese lorry, uh, up to the Pang La for the first great view of the, of the north face of Everest. Then we made our way around to the village of Carter, which I mentioned earlier. In Carter, our rather ineffectual Chinese li liaison officer and interpreter tried to um, organize the, the transport from there to base camp. It was pretty shambolic, uh, but eventually something was sorted out and we set off on the 30 mile journey to base camp. It was, I think it was March the 3rd, it was late winter, it was a glorious morning, the sun was shining, and it was just lovely to be setting out on this adventure. Uh, we were a, a source of immense fascination to the locals, and we were particularly fascinating to the locals because as we were walking through a village called Moyo on that first morning, that, that lovely morning in the sunshine, an old man came up, he said his name was Tashi, and he was thrilled to meet our, our transport officer, who was uh, a man called Norbu Tensing, who um, is the oldest son of Tensing Norge, who made the first ascent of Mount Everest in 1953. And Norbu was part of our support team He'd never been to Tibet before. I mean, he spent most of his life in, in California. And they were just thrilled to hear that, that, that Tenzing's son was here. And the reason they were thrilled is because Tenzing Norgay, uh, contrary to um, what is said in many of the history books, was not Nepal. He wasn't a Sherpa. He wasn't Indian. He, he was a Tibetan. And he was born, possibly born, actually, at a, a, at a summer campground in the Karma Valley. Anyway, he was from Kata. So they were thrilled to see Norbu. Norbu looked slightly sort of bewildered by all these people claiming to be his long lost cousins <laughs> or gathering for the photos. And then it was great, it was very moving. We were invited in to, to have tea with, with Tashi and his family and went into this, you know, this smoke blackened house and, and various 
people arrive and this mother with her baby and, and a young cousin called Sonam Futi, who's actually ended up as one of the, the porters for the expedition. So that was a, a very moving start to our great adventure. And as I said, there's just this lovely sense of setting off on a great journey. And, and there's nothing like waking up in the morning and the, the smell, the smell of, of, of the cooking fires and, and the yaks tethered there, waiting to have their loads to set off on the day's march. Alas, the day's march proved to be very short. I think we were averaged about a mile a day. And um, it became obvious that one thing that has not changed in, in Tibet over the years is that the, the Protestant work ethic has still not really caught on there. And it's not a place you want to be in a hurry. And more importantly, we, we decided to go to start in, in late winter to get to the mountain as early as possible to give ourselves a good chance. Unlike the 1920 expeditions, when they usually didn't even get to base camp till sometime in May, and then had this desperate rush to try and get up the mountain before the monsoon arrived. So we were arriving very early in the year, which it was a good idea, but there was a problem that was still a lot of snow around, which was deemed too dangerous for the ax, which are their most precious possessions. And also we had some pretty stormy weather with a lot of fresh snowfall. So basically we spent two weeks at what we call pre-base camp, wondering if we were ever gonna get over the Lang Malar, that high pass, which I, which I mentioned earlier. But eventually after two weeks, we, we continued, not with yaks, but with a hundred people um, employed to carry the luggage and made our way slowly up to the Lang Malar, thrilling to get there. And Mimi here, uh, Mimi Zeman, the expedition doctor, thrilled to be here. So it's, it's about, 5,700 meters above sea level. It's a very high pass um, at the little shrine on the pass before descending into the Karma Valley. Mimi was the expedition doctor. Uh, got over the other side, this great sort of bandabast of, of luggage and porters and all our stuff, everything we needed for the next three months, came over the pass, camped just over the other side, and then continued down into the Karma Valley where it proceeded to snow and we were hit by blizzards, many delays, luggage got lost, left behind, people had to go and collect luggage. Sometimes we didn't go anywhere for two or three days, a lot of standing around, a lot of frustration. It felt quite tough and it was tough for us with our fancy modern equipment. And my God, it was tough for these poor people working in those conditions. Uh, it probably goes without saying that the men spent a lot of time whinging, uh, while the women usually just sort of quietly got on with the job and remained stoic and cheerful. Well, here's a very happy Paul Tier, Paul from Lake Tahoe, on the penultimate camp before base camp. The weather had improved again. This was our last campsite, and we knew the next day we would arrive at base camp. And it was just lovely to think we... Uh, 23 days after setting out from Carter, we finally made it to base camp. And Passang, who is a Sherpa from Nepal, who came as expedition headman and cook, he helped Robert uh, deal with the payment of all, of all the hundred or so people uh, so that they could all take, take, take their money back home. And then from that point onwards, we were, we were basically alone, uh, eight of us, four climbers, plus Mimi, uh, a photographer called Joe Blackburn, uh, Passang, the expedition cook, and a young Tibetan lad called Kassang who came to help. And this was our home for the next, next about uh, nine weeks. Lovely meadow at about five and a half thousand meters above sea level with Everest a few miles in the background there, a few miles away. Lovely spot um, and, and far nicer than the golf forsaken base camp that they all go to on the other side of the mountain. Ad advanced base at the head of the Kangshan Glacier was, was more austere, but my God, it was a spectacular place. It was an incredible amphitheater with these immense great walls just rising around us. And we had pitched our camp at quite a respectful distance from the wall uh, because there are a lot of avalanches on the east side of Everest. If you want to see avalanches, this is the place to go. It was just there, boom, boom. They were just going off all the time. Um, often without much rhyme or reason. It could be in the morning, it could be in the afternoon. Uh, I think this one was in the evening as we were cooking supper. Boom, there's another one coming off peak 38. Uh, Choma Lunzo there in the background. Spectacular and obviously terrifying. It was the thing that frightened me most before setting off on this expedition. Here we are, this is looking from advanced base camp. This is what we call a LOTC special coming down off the north face 
east face of Lhotse. Up on right on the right of the picture is the the, the great towering buttress which the Americans had climbed in 1983. We thought we're probably not capable of repeating that, but Ed Webster had come up with the idea of attempting a buttress on the left. We call it the Never Rest Buttress because we worked we work very hard on this expedition. And the idea was if we could climb that buttress, get onto the easier snow slopes above, wind our way through all those ice cliffs, we would eventually get to the South Col. If we got to the South Col, first people ever to get there from Tibet, we would then continue up the original 1953 route to the summit. So that was the plan. The plan involved getting up early, which I hate, but it has to be done. You, you wake, the alarm goes off at three in the morning, you drag yourself reluctantly out of your sleeping bag, you get geared up, go out and have a bit of breakfast, and then set off in the dark just by the light of your head torches. Um, because uh, if there's one thing I've learned about mountaineering is you never say, oh, I wish we'd set off a bit later. <laughs> And uh, it's always good to have time in hand. And it's gen generally safer in the cold hours of the earlier morning. And you just get these, we're on the east face, so just, we had these glorious sunrises. And it was the most spectacular, beautiful place to be. It was just a joy to be climbing there, climbing up very steep terrain, very technical climbing, um, you know, almost, almost as good as, 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 you know, anything you could do in the Cairngorms. Uh, just just mag magnificent. Uh, rock climbing, mixed climbing, some stupendous ice climbing, um, extraordinary scenery. The great um, Victorian mountaineer, Leslie Stephen, uh, one of my predecessors as president of the Alpine Club, he, he once uh, wrote that mountain scenery is the antithesis not so much of the plains as of the commonplace. Its charm lies in its vigorous originality. Very true. We were quite conservative in our approach. There was some very hard climbing and we fixed ropes at all the hardest initial part of the climb. So basically we laid siege to the mountain and we traveled up and down day by day, taking it in turn to leads. There were obviously spells of bad weather when this is at camp one, Robert and Ed, um, looking rather groggy after their first night out at camp one. At times we were back down at base camp resting there, at other times uh, at advanced base. Uh, and in a total of seven weeks on the mountain, probably 33 days I think were spent actually climbing. Thinking back to 1924, no, this was 1922 when Morshead, Mallory, Somerville and Norton descended from the first ever uh, attempt on Mount Everest on the north side in their tweed jackets. And I often wonder what they would, would have made of us 66 years later. Uh, sponsored by a cosmetics company. There was a lot of rather childish um, behavior during this particular photo shoots at Advanced Base Camp. Uh, and then these photos were duly sent off to Kiel to their office in Manhattan. And uh, blow me, they actually used them. Not only that, <laughs> only about a year ago, Robert, sends an email to us say, hey boys, I was, um, I was just going through Hong Kong airport today. I dropped into the Kiel shop and we're, we're still there up on the wall. <laughs> Eventually after many weeks, well, about four weeks work, we had established a camp one, a camp two on the East Face. We'd done all we could to prepare. Uh, the weather seemed to be coming good and we set off on what we hoped would be an attempt to the summit. And I'm just, just going to describe it very briefly before we have some, some, some some questions, I hope. And this is Ed Webster with his amazing blue eyes at Camp One, a couple of gas stoves going full blast, melting snow for our supper at Camp One. Uh, that was actually on, on uh, May the 8th, 1988. On May the 9th, it started snowing again. We, we really thought, oh my God, we're putting our heads in a noose. We were on huge, potentially avalanche prone snow slopes. It took us 14 hours to get up to where we'd left a cache for our Camp Two the, the, the previous week. Uh, this is a very weary Ed after 14 hours arriving at Camp 2. But we were blessed with good weather again, and on May the 10th, we were able to continue up the final part of the east face of Everest, uh, steepening again, very hard work, higher than three of us had ever been before, uh, finally breaking out onto the South Col, um, at just under, I think it's about 7,990 metres above sea level. Uh, broke out there after, an, again, a long day, an 11-hour day to get to the South Coal, arriving there all in five layers of clothing, 
carrying in our rucksacks, our two tents, gas stoves, bit of food, and, and so on. Got the tents up and settled down for the night as best we could, looking up at the final uh, summit pyramid with the, the clouds blasting across it. And, uh, and it. Because we're now on the South Coal exposed to the westerly winds, and it felt very different from the east face. Well, we've now reached the South Coal uh, over, on the, over on the left there, and we just had the remaining mere 900 meters. It sounds nothing, 900 meters, you know, a, 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 a Munro <laughs> from, to, to the top. But you're starting at, at 8,000 meters above sea level, and there's only a third of normal air pressure. Uh, and so you're not going to be going in a hurry. To explain very briefly, Paul didn't feel very well, and he decided to go back down to send the route back down to advanced base camp where Mimi and Joe were waiting. And so it was just three of us the following day after a day's rest and waiting for the winds to subside. It was just three of us, Robert, Ed and myself, who set off at 11 o'clock at night uh, to see how far we could get and maybe get to the summit. After several hours climbing in the dark, it was thrilling at last to see the sun rise, to see the famous view down to the South Col across to Lotsi on the right, and then about 12 miles away, the Great Pyramid of Makalu, the world's fifth house mountain. And right out on the horizon, about 80 miles away in Sikkim, close to Darjeeling, uh, the summit of Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain on earth. Just thrilling actually to see it and to be there. Uh, thrilling, but a thrill sort of seen through a very blurred vision, a sort of, uh, a, 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 a sort of miasma uh, of, of, of hypoxic blur because we were all in a state of total exhaustion. We were climbing without oxygen and not many people had ever reached the summit without oxygen. And it's very, very, very hard. And uh, uh, frequently we, we just sort of felt, I'm, this is too difficult, I can't do it. To cut a long story short, Robert and Ed both made it to the south summit of Everest, which is just 100 meters vertically from the top, but were there so late in the day they couldn't continue. I got there a little bit earlier, about one o'clock in the afternoon, and looked across at this famous final ridge, which I knew because I'd seen it in the pictures. And uh, this is the first ever photograph taken of that final ridge on May the 26th, 1953, when I think Charles Evans took this picture of Tom Bordillon looking yearningly up that final ridge. And it was at that point uh, with problems with the oxygen sets getting late in the day that Charles turns to Tom Bordillon and said, Tom, if you want to see Jennifer again, his wife, you've got to go back down. And very reluctantly, the younger man agreed that they, they, would, they would do the sensible thing, turn around and go back down to the South Coal, having taken a final look at what three days later became known as the Hillary Step, when Ed Hillary and Tenzing Norgay with better functioning oxygen sets, starting from a much higher camp, managed to climb that, that final bit to the summit. So I knew about all this, but actually to see it was thrilling. And I did take a picture as I made my way across to the Hillary Step, wondering, still hoping that Paul, uh, that, that Robert and Ed might catch up and maybe they might, might, might follow on to the summit. Just to try and give you some notion of what it's like up there, uh, no one, very few people had done this with that oxygen at that stage, I think 20 people. The first had been almost exactly 10 years earlier when Reinhold Massner and Peter Habler became the first people to reach the top without oxygen. And this is just a very brief clip of film by, got up the by Messner the, uh, in 1978. And filmed as I came up. Reinhold didn't blame me, he was just filming. I, the slack, you know, was down. And again, it was in my way, I put it somewhere the rope and then I got, got up to him and he did continue. Within short time he reached the summit and he was sitting there beside the Chinese pole and I, I just remember seeing him and uh, in the last moment I thought well we are going to make it and I went up towards him and uh, all I remember I started crying I, started, I, cry, I cried like a little child I was just happy we were there you know? I wasn't I wasn't uh, proud or whatever 
And I wasn't even aware, and I don't think he was aware, that we were sitting on top of Everest, which we had done without any oxygen, you know. We were just on a mountain uh, somewhere in the world. Well, 10 years on, the, the Chinese flagpole was no longer there on the summit. I found three empty oxygen cylinders and some prayer flags. I reached the summit at, at 10 to 4, no, sorry, at 20 to 4 in the afternoon. And I said to myself, whatever happens, I'm turning around at 4 o'clock. So I just made it in time. And at 10 to 4, I turned around to go back down. Uh, interestingly, um, back in 1921, Alexander Kellis calculated, he postulated that uh, he said, a, a reasonably fit mountaineer, given reasonable conditions, at that altitude ought to be able to make 100 metres an, an hour uphill progress, which is exactly what Reinhold Messner and Peter Habeler achieved in 1978. I'm not Messner or Habeler, uh, and I was only managing about 60 metres an hour. I actually took me 16 hours to get from the South Pole to the summit. And as I said, Robert and, and Ned, alas, didn't quite make it. We, we're just not as good as Messner and Harper and some other and many other people. So it was getting late in the day, and and I, I thought I'll get back down to the South Pole by by nightfall. Alas, I only got down to about eight thousand six hundred meters, and darkness fell, and I decided it's crazy to continue in the dark. So rather reluctantly, I cut a ledge in the snow, and just lay there to shiver for the next seven or eight hours in the darkness. But I was comforted by the knowledge that um, when Dougal Haston took this famous photograph of Doug Scott on the summit in 1975, at sunset, they both were committed to the idea they were going to be sleeping out virtually on the summit of Everest, even higher than I spent the night out. They didn't even have the decency to get frostbite. Doug didn't even have a down jacket on. Uh, again, they're tougher than I am. But I knew you, you, can, you can survive a night out at that altitude, provided it's not windy. And I did survive. And in the morning, I, I did rejoin my companions, who'd also been benighted a bit, a bit lower down. And looking pretty beaten up, it has to be said, we made our way down to the South Coal. And eventually, after a long, is another whole story, but eventually, after another three days or so, we, we made it back down to our fixed ropes, continuing on the final day through the night, eventually back down. Uh, to advance base camp, and here we are uh, about, I think about half an hour after we got back down at dawn to advance base camp, nine days after setting out. So it was a very, a rather battered, but very happy team that posed for a final photograph taken by Paul, who, the chap who had turned back early. And, and I do say, and I do believe that uh, there's not much courage involved in climbing mountains, but to turn back does show true courage, the kind of courage that Bord Dylan and Evans showed in 1953, and which Paul showed uh, in, in 1988, uh, getting down in good time, in good health, and being there to pick up the pieces when we eventually returned. So we returned with much celebration eventually back to the village of Carter, following in the finest traditions of Everest expeditions, drinking Tongba, which is a sort of mulled Tibetan Chang, uh, and just enjoying the, the wonderful sweetness of, of returning to life and greenery and flowers in that beautiful valley. Which brings me to the end of my talk, and I hope there's left some time uh, for some, some questions before we pack up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Stephen. Just a, a brief moment here while the roving microphones are picked up. We certainly do have time for questions. One of the things that Stephen mentioned is that, that he, he would be happy if we've got time. If anybody does have an interest or questions in South Georgia, that's all uh, valid as well. Nothing is off limits. <laughs> Nothing's off limits, yes. <laughs> so can we have some uh, some hands so here? Uh, Adrian. Thank you. Lovely talk. Um, when do you imagine, you know, between the the twenties and now, when did they when did you or the 
climbers generally realize the importance of sunscreen? <laughs> um, I do. I do know that um, I believe Sandy Irvin got terribly sunburnt in 1924, and he had very fair skin, actually, as, as I do. Um, I don't know the answer to your question, sunscreen. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what was available in the 1920s. Uh, people did seem to manage um, with, with their fair European skin. Um, we, we took great trouble. Um, Kiehl's actually made up a special, they called our Everest cream. This sort of paste, it was this thick paste. And I did make a point of just plastering it on my face every morning and it, it seemed to, to work quite well. But I don't know when when people first really got to grips with it. Am I right in thinking that the man after whom this hill was named, his name was actually pronounced Everest rather than Everest? Yes. We've been calling this mountain the wrong name for years. Yeah, it was it's Sir George Everest, yeah. Um director of director of the Survey of India. Um and when they yeah, they they, they decided to name it after him. And, and I believe he, he was not very keen on the idea. And at that stage, they said they weren't aware that it had a local name. Um, but by the time of the early expeditions, it became obvious that the mountain had a name, Chomalungma. <laughs> However, I think that by that stage, Everest mis mispronounced as Everest had sort of stuck. And it's become such a sort of trade name it seems to, unlike some mountains like Mount McKinley, which is now firmly known as Denali, Everest seems to have stuck with Everest. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very enjoyable show and some very nice pictures. But the question I've got is, who actually paid for the Sherpas in the 1922 expe exhibition, expedition? And who paid for your Sherpas? What sort of money are you talking about? And also, to be supplementary, you said that the European experienced climbers, but surely the Sherpas were equally good because not only did they climb up beside you, they carried all your gear, apart from the last Monroe. Uh, which looked difficult. But my, you know, my reference to the 1953 exhibition is, is that at that stage, um, Sherpas were working on mountains and they, they were doing it to earn money. Uh, but these, these were farmers, traders. Uh, they didn't go climbing for fun like we do. They got better, more important things to do. And they had very little technical climbing experience. Um, so, for instance, the, the famous Kumbu Icefall, uh, which involves climbing through all these ice towers and, and so on, in 1953, the job of keeping that open was down to a, a man called Mike Westmacott, uh, really in charge of the Sherpa people who were helping him. Um, that has now <laughs> been reversed because there are a lot of Sherpas who are extremely experienced mountaineers and they're now running the show. Um, but I think it certainly was true that, that in those days, um, there weren't any local people who went climbing for fun or who had that kind of experience with technical climbing. And uh, sorry, the first part of your question was about who paid for it all. Uh, the, the early SR Everest expeditions, they generally did a deal with newspapers, um, usually with the Times for exclusive rights. And so they were basically sponsored by the Times. And, and obviously one of the costs of the expedition was the wage bill. And... Uh, and, and so, so they, that's how they that's how they raised the money. In, in 1953, they had many sponsors, and 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 it was a pretty big budget expedition by the standards of the time. And I think again, the Times paid for a lot of it. Did you have much to do with the Yeti? No, no I'm afraid not. I'm sorry to disappoint you. No, no. we, we Patsan got excited about some, some 
tracks in the snow when we were coming over the Lang Malar. And then we, you know, found a pile of, of goat droppings. Yeah, mm -hmm. very disappointing, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, oh, thanks. Um, one of one of your photographs uh, did show quite a lot of debris and refuse left by these expeditions on the mountains, and I, and I just wondered um, whether things have changed for the better now with regard to uh, waste and oxygen tanks and stuff left by uh, the Europeans on these mountains. I, I'm not sure, debris. I'm, well, I did have a photo of the summit with some empty oxygen cylinders. Um, I think that was the only one. Um, we didn't encounter anything really. Uh, a, a few bits, tatty remains of the old bit of rope on the way up to the South Coal, but in those days people didn't fix ropes all the way to the summit the way they do now. So we didn't re find anything very much. I'm afraid we left gear on the mountain ourselves because um, our plan to strip all the ropes uh, just went all out of the window because by the time we eventually did descend, we were in a very weak state and we you know, barely got ourselves down. So I'm ashamed to say we left all our fixed ropes in place and we, we left a whole camp at Camp One. And in fact, left a couple of tents on the South Coal, which was subsequently retrieved. And in fact, my Gore-Tex windsuit which I left at the South Coal. Um, I since, many years later saw a photograph of some Nepalese Sherpa wearing it, I think, on Davagiri. But so I'm afraid we left we left stuff on the mountain. Um, uh, I've seen pictures of the mountain more recently, and, and it looks utterly horrendous. They've got thousands of people going up there every year now, and, and just remains of tents piled on remains of tents piled on remains of tents, and it just looks utterly hideous. Yeah. Just before we take the mm. question in the back, this one come in oh. from. Yes, uh, and it's a question about the pipes. Uh, you showed photographs of lots of early mountaineers smoking. Oh, they're the pipes, yeah. Um, and the question is, did many people on your expedition smoke? And was that a crazy <laughs> thing to do? Yeah, well, I think a, a, a pipe clenched firmly between the teeth was de rigueur for a proper explorer in the, in the 20s. Uh, we didn't smoke pipes. Um, I think we had some camel cigarettes at base camp, um, and we had the odd cigarette. Uh, but so I certainly didn't smoke high on the mountain. And I do remember um, the final stretch to the summit. I was going very slowly and and coughing and spluttering a bit and thinking oh, it's time to give up smoking. I, mean, <laughs> I was never a heavy smoker, I should add, but but. Um, and I have, I have since given up smoking, and, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Although George Finch, the great pioneer in 1922, he was a, a very heavy smoker, and he reckoned it was it, it helped your lungs get used to having to work really hard, which, which I thought for a scientist was a rather dodgy bit of <laughs> scientific research. One week back. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, you talked a lot about kind of technical climbing, and I'm just wondering how do you go about deciding how you're going to tackle something if it's not been climbed before? I can't see where you are, but thank you for the question. Oh, there. H how do we go about deciding? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, thank you. It's an interesting question. We, um, well, back in Colorado, Ed just looked at, he had one photo of the face and said, oh, maybe we can find a way up this buttress. And that was the plan, really. That was it. And then... And then when we got there, uh, I remember the first time I went up to advanced space with Paul, uh, looking up at the buttress, and actually even from the Lang Malar, from 18 miles away, we'd looked and said, oh, what about those towers? Will we find a way through them? And, and then I got up there with Paul closer to, and so what about that gully there? That might be the way to go. And then we got back to base camp and talked to Robert and Ed, who'd been up there the previous day, and they said, yeah, we we're thinking of that gully. And, God, Robert said, oh yeah, it reminded me a bit of Ben Nevis, so we'll call it the Scottish Gully. And, and so we were all just sort of thinking more or less along the same lines, um, just looking at it and spotting really lines of weakness and saying, well, let's, let's go and give it a try. And, and so that's what we did. And, but day by day, obviously, you know, the, the plan evolved and you didn't always end up going the way you thought you were going to go because there was some obstacle or it 
proved too dangerous. Um, and the, the real critical bit was a bit what we call the cauliflower towers, these big ice towers, and that that was the sort of big question mark. But we did eventually find a way through them. But it's very much a, a, a done by consensus. Uh, well, it's consensus, but when you're out in front on the day leading, if you're leading, you you decide where the route goes because you're you're there on the spot, which is very exciting. Uh, we're used to seeing pictures now of tourists snaking up the sides of Everest. And I wondered if you could say something about that and how what they're doing compares to what you did. And, and do, do many of them actually reach the summit? I mean, what's it all about? Well, quite frankly, I'm not very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, I'm actually a very a far, far better climber than me uh, wrote recently and he was asked about this and he said something to the point that it, these people are not climbers, they're just taking high altitude exercise and it's time we stop taking any notice of them. But um, some people would say that's rather elitist, but I would say what's wrong with elitism? <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm quite frank, I'm really bored by the whole thing. Um, you know, okay, if someone wants to be taken up Everest, fine. And it's obviously thrilling to get to the top of Everest, but uh, to my mind, it's not mountaineering. And, and to me, mountaineering is about um, setting your own agenda, making, making your own decisions, um, doing as much as you can with as little as possible and embarking on an enterprise where you have no idea whether you're actually going to succeed rather than paying a lot of money for a foregone conclusion. Uh, and of course, yeah, of course, it's, it's very hard work to climb to 29,000 feet, even using oxygen. It requires a huge commitment, a, a certain level of risk, but um, these, these, this infrastructure they've created is obviously very efficient. And in answer to your question, yeah, they get masses of people to the summit. Um, and I, I have a cousin who's reached the summit of Everest, and he actually said, uh, I said, did you go with Jagged Blow Globe? And he said, no, no, I went with whatever company it was. He said, I did a lot of research and I realized they had the highest success rate. So I went with them. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a business transaction. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask what's the kind of next big kind of challenge in mountaineering considering that as that gentleman before me mentioned, um, Everest has sort of now become a tourist attraction. So what's the next big challenge? Well, I don't know if it's the next big challenge. I mean, you know, we did that route on Everest 36 years ago, and there've been many much harder and, and bolder climbs done since then by people of astonishing uh, boldness and, and vision. So uh, it's not really the next thing, it's that it's something that evolves. and. There are, there are hundreds of thousands of mountains around the world, including many hundreds and thousands that are still not, haven't even been climbed. So really, um, it's limitless. But or what's exciting is always, I think, to go where someone hasn't gone before. And, and obviously, that's not going to be the highest mountains in the world. It's going to be some quite high mountains. It's going to be maybe one of the many 7,000 meter peaks in the Himalayas, which haven't even had a second ascent, where there are whole valleys that have barely, barely been visited. Um, and, and so it's that, and it's also uh, people doing, doing more with less. So I've often said, well, you know, if someone wants to do something exciting on Everest, how about going to our, doing our route well, without any fixed routes? ropes, do what's called alpine style. You literally pack your rucksack, start at the bottom, climb the route, get to the top. Probably you wouldn't be able to descend the same way. You'd have to go down the North Ridge perhaps and do a traverse to the mountain. Uh, and it's, it's, it's finding imaginative ways of doing things differently rather than some sort of ultimate final quest. <laughs> How did it change your life? Did you settle back down into normal life or <laughs> apart from doing talks like this, what else? <laughs> well, one thing that happened was um, when I got back, I, I had a book contract to do a book which had been delayed because of going to Everest. And I got a very nice phone call from my editor at Hodder and Stout and she said, I think we're going to have to refresh your contract, <laughs> which was 
music to my ears. And I got taken out to lunch at a rather smart restaurant. <laughs> so there were little things like that. Uh, according to my wife, who's here tonight, I became a much nicer person. <laughs> so, you know, so I managed to get rid of some of that sort of testosterone fueled ambition, perhaps. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think I, um, no, it's obviously nice to pull off something very hard and, and to uh, and to survive a great adventure. Um, and undoubtedly, it was very, very hard. And, it's the hardest thing I've done. So it's very, very thrilling just to have done that and to be able to enjoy the memories of it. Um, and, and it didn't make me think I've then got to, now got to go and do something even harder. Uh, <laughs> just concentrate on staying alive. <laughs> Could you speak a bit about the training and preparation involved for the expedition? Training? Uh, you're talking to the wrong person. So I don't do training, <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> I mentioned Messler, Messler, Harbler, Peter Harbler got to the summit from the South Col in nine hours or ten hours. He got back down to the Salt South Col in one hour. Um, they're in a different league. So, uh, but to, uh, to give you a slightly less uh, flippant answer, uh, I'm not very good about training, but uh, that stage I was moderately young, I was quite fit. I'd been on about 10 Himalayan expeditions. And the previous autumn I'd been on, I'd been to nearly 8,000 meters on Shisha Pangma um, and survived an unplanned bivouac actually there at about 7,700 meters. Um, and thought, yes, I'm, I can function at, at altitude. So it was, a, it was an accumulation of experience. And on the actual expedition, it took us, uh, it took us 23 days to get from Carter to, to base camp. And during that time, we were getting nicely fit, getting attuned, getting into the right frame of mind, getting to know each other. And I think that's the great joy of a, an expedition that takes place over three or four months, rather than one where you're dashing in, and sometimes by helicopter, apparently, and dashing back home again. Uh, you don't get that sort of gradual acclimatization and familiarization. We've got a, a question about altitude sickness. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, I was also interested in that. Obviously, uh, you have to take it slowly to give your body time. Um, was that part of your strategy? Giving yes, your... I, I, I acclimatize very slowly, and um, I hate to be rushed. Uh, and as I said, we took in nearly a month to get to base camp. And during that time, we went three or four times to the Lang Malar, that high 5,800 meter pass. So we were, yeah, we, I was actually monitoring my, you know, um, um, pulse rate and so on. Um, and we were getting fitter and more acclimatized. So we, apart from Paul, no one really got ill. Paul did feel ill when we got to the South Col, and quite, it's quite possible that he was showing the, the beginnings of cerebral edema, which is fatal. Um, and so his decision to descend was was mm. very wise and the right decision. Um, the three of us who continued to the summit, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we were in a pretty ropey state by the time we got down because we, we only planned to spend at the most 24 hours above 8,000 meters and then we were there for nearly four days and it showed. So we were in a very ropey state when we came down and, and a, a, a well-known physiologist we were talking to afterwards he said yeah you i think you probably all had a bit of edema actually and and so it, it, you know as we all know human beings are not, not really designed to operate up there so it, you you are putting yourself in a risky situation there's no denying and how it. long does it take to recover from that for your body to go uh, back yes yes yeah, interesting i i was i was very weak after that expedition actually um I think we we did take a lot out of ourselves. I lost a lot of weight and, and yeah, just very weak. And and we all suffered some frostbite and that had to be dealt with. I lost some toes. So yeah, we weren't in the, in the best shape when we got back. And it was probably yeah, a few weeks, even months before I was back to full strength. Can I, can I sneak in with a, a left field question I've been dying to ask you here. If you were, setting off on a two-month expedition just now. I know you're very interested in music. What two pieces 
<laughs> of music would you take with you? Um, right, yeah, well, uh, Paul listens to a lot of heavy metal. Uh, uh, my tastes are probably, he might consider rather rarefied, but um, before uh, setting off on the summit push that morning, uh, four in the morning, I was all ready to leave, geared up, head torch on, and, and bloody Webster, as usual, wasn't re ready. <laughs> Getting Webster going in the morning was a nightmare. So uh, rather than stand around and get cold, I went back into my tent. I put on my Walkman. Anyone remember Walkman? <laughs> And this will sound incredibly pretentious, but listen to the whole of Liszt's B, 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 B minor piano sonata, which is the most wonderful piece of music to my mind. And it's really epic. It's like an epic journey. It lasts for about 25 minutes. I listened to that. It was fantastic. And then put my Walkman away. Uh, said, are you ready now, Ebster? And we set off to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> so that was one of them. And when we got down nine days later, having nearly died, um, we got into the tents. God, it's blissful. And... Mimi, we had one oxygen bottle for medicinal purposes. Mimi gave Ed some oxygen because he had this terrible frostbite in his fingers. And she brought us these bowls and bowls of fruit juice because we were very parched. And then I said, oh, can you find my, my Walkman, Mimi? And she brought it and I got out and I listened to, again, it'll sound terribly pretentious, uh, Brahms's Horn Trio. And it's the most, to my mind, the most beautiful, beautiful music. And it just sort of summed up my feelings. So there you are. <laughs> <laughs> One more question before we wind up. Thanks very much, Stephen, uh, for that fantastic talk and all the amazing photographs that you showed us. Just very quickly, about seven or eight years ago, Brian Blessed gave a talk uh, for The Guardian, and I asked him about his relationship with Captain John Knoll. And to my surprise, he said that uh, Noel died in his arms, but also told him a story that there was a stowaway on the 1924 exhibition called Nicky Weatherall. Ah. And I can't find any information about this anywhere. And I guess you'd be the best person to ask. Yeah, well, I, I don't think Brian Blessed would be my first choice of reliable information. So. <laughs> I couldn't possibly. He said, I, I, and he, when he said Captain Noel died in his arms, in, in Brian Blessed's arms. Yeah, well, Brian has always been a fantasist, but I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> I do know that my editor, um, Maggie Body, when we got back from Everest, she happened to be doing a, a revised edition of, of um, John Knowles' account of his Ill illegal journey to Everest in 1912. And by that stage, he was about 90, and, but he was still alive. And she did say, uh, she went to see John Knowles at his house in Kent, and she said, oh, have you heard about this, our, our chap Venables? He's just climbed the east face of Everest. And apparently John Knowles said, doesn't have an east face. <laughs> so there you are. That's all, that's all I can tell you about John Knowles. I think that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty good way to, to finish this off. But it's not quite the finish because, of course, um, as soon as we're finished here, wine and soft drinks available out in the foyer. Stephen, I'm sure, will have a few minutes to uh, to answer any more questions that you may have if you corner them. Um, the next talk that we have in two weeks' time is Professor Hester Parr of this university, and she's talking on why the relationship between climate change and mental health in Scotland matters. One of the aspects she's going to touch on is um, seasonal affective disorder, which would be quite interesting to a lot of us after the last few weeks, I think. So that's in two weeks' time. And it just remains to thank Stephen so much for coming and giving his time and uh, entertaining and educating us. I think we've had a full biography of Everest this evening, as well as uh, some first-hand hints of what it's really like at 29,000 feet, and when you're tempted to turn the heating up a wee bit, uh, next, maybe think back to that. So thank you so much, Stephen, for coming. I just present you with them oh. as a memento, this society's paperweights. Oh, thank you very much. It's not a digital equivalent, but it's. Thanks, <laughs> guys.